My name is David Perring. I work as Director of Research for Fosway Group. We're an independent analyst and that means we're just very nosy about what happens in the learning and technology market. And we did some research that was sponsored by Sum Total, who are at stand there, number 17, um, around talent management and how that's changing in response to changes in the workforce and changes of work. And what I'm here to do today is share some of that research with you to let you know. And then you can give me some feedback as I go through maybe on does that resonate with you? Is it different? What's different? And things like that. So I'll try not to walk into the sun. There we go. So um, as I said, we did some research. We had about 540 respondents, I think. And they were based from around the world. So 61% came from Europe. So there's quite a strong European vent to this and actually in, within that European number quite a lot of people from the UK but also quite a large number from people from Africa which is a, a first for us these are actually um, people from some totals and Skillsoft's database actually so the people from Africa were more from South Africa but there were people from as broad and widely a field as Ethiopia even so it's really interesting to sort of get we've got quite a broad spread in terms of the role there was quite a broad range of roles, so most people were at management level, a significant proportion, about 21% from a directorate level, and then there was just others, so people in more consultant role. So there's quite a, a broad range, so this is a bit of a, I suppose, a global perception or perspective, and it's also an international perspective, but heavily weighted towards Europe, which is probably what you'd expect anyway for the sorts of solutions in our audience. Now, in terms of the numbers of employees, the big white bit that should look like grey on the chart was just small organisations, sub 250. The, but you can see there's quite a large spread up here of organisations that are pretty much over 5,000 employees. So again, there's quite a wide range of organisation size, but it's quite broadly representative if that makes sense. So there's not a really strong um, geographical bias or a strong numeric bias in terms of the sorts of organisations that are responding. And in terms of their organizations and what they were doing, the people who responded, you can see that the biggest area that we had respondents from was learning professionals. So that's the darker gray, just up in here. Maybe back in this side. So up here. Now, as you can see, there's a wide range of people from reward, workforce management, onboarding. But there's a bit of a learning skew in terms of the sorts of respondents that we had. So this is maybe a little bit more of a, a learning viewer talent rather than a holistic talent wide view of talent. Now again another question for you is just uh, what sort of role do you have in your organizations? Are you responsible just for learning? Okay. Are you responsible for talent management? Okay. So a smaller number. Okay. Responsible for something completely different from not talent. And what are you responsible for? So. Marketing, okay, interesting. Okay. But as you see, again, we sort of got this sort of skew towards the um, L and D. And what we asked them was the things around the modern workers, modern work, and modern working. And these are some of the things they told us. So there are three things that are changing organizations, the workforce, and the technology that they use. And in terms of their encounters with um, technology, they're starting, or, or work, they're starting to more often work in more diverse teams. So they're seeing that actually the diversity, and that means age diversity, um, not just other elements of diversity, is increasing. 68% are working more with virtual technology, so actually they're more um, dispersed and more remote in how they work, and that has some very interesting implications for how we manage them and engage them and support them as learners. 55% um, are more often um, working in collaboration and with social media tools, and I more often see that as a key way of working. I'm not sure if you see that in your own life or in your own work patterns. Does that seem similar? Are you using, we, for example, in our organization, we're a small organization, we use things like Slack to communicate around projects. People use Slack. Yeah? This is fundamentally changing the way we interact. It used to be email, and now it's actually a social collaboration tool. And in reality, that's also affecting how we learn in a really significant way. Um, and that's in response not only to the technology, but also people's preferences. 
Um, the other thing that comes out is actually people using mobile devices more. Um, I see lots of you got your mobile device already. Sorry to stand in the way. Um, so interesting, uh, the systems that you need to have that support learners themselves are changing as well. So people are seeing 44% are seeing more uh, mobile wor working mobile devices in their day-to-day -day work. What they're also seeing is um, the ch nature of how they work changing as well. So for example, 50% say they're more often doing things that are self-service. And I'm sure you encounter that yourselves. If you book a holiday, you're probably going self-service, choose, and in certain systems they're now enabling you to do that using Alexa. So you can say, Alexa, I'd like the end of July off on holiday. And Alexa will go and check through the HR system to find out if that space is free and will say, yes, you can go on holiday then, David. Without even any approvals, right? Because you could block out the time and say, when this is, people can't go on holiday. So the world is changing. The points of contact are changing in terms of that self-service as well. And people experience more virtual and augmented te technologies. Um, what's really interesting, I heard people talk about AI. And people talk about AI as being artificial intelligence. There's another interpretation of that, which is augmented intelligence is helping people act more intelligently because they've got the device supporting them. So these are the sorts of flavors that are coming out. So seeing 40%, 46% of employees experience more virtual and augmented technologies. Um, not really Google Glass, I think that went to the wall a while ago. But they're also seeing automation and AI replacing employees' work. So these are changes in the workplace. And employees are tracked using real-time performance more and the employees have more flexibility over where and when they work. I'm not sure if that's resonant with you. Do you feel as actually you're more of a mobile worker or do you have to go into the office every day? Do you have to go into the office every day? Yeah. So it's a small number, but increasingly people's expectations are that they can work and behave more remotely. So actually the nature of work is changing. And because of all these changes, what's starting to happen is that people are starting to want to or need to work faster. So the actual pace of business and business change is increasing. And this what's interesting is this was the highest response. Is people expected to work increasingly faster. And I, and I think that's some really interesting implications for the sorts of technologies that we look to deploy. Because actually there's an element of business agility that we need to respond to people's demands in different ways. It's not just that there's a whole new tranche of workers coming into the workforce who have very different expectations than my grey-haired generation had about training, um, but there's also just the technology imperative that's changing as well. So on top of that, you also have all the changes in demographics. So at the moment, 50% of the workforce are my age, Gen X, 50% of baby boom, well, 25% of baby boom is 25% Gen X, and 50% are Gen Y. And then there's a, a Gen Z that's coming. And I'm not sure, again, if you see that in your workforce, but the workforce itself is becoming more diverse, and the expectations of those people in their different um, age ranges is slightly different as well. So if we look at um, what this means to some extent is people, the newer workforce and, and the modern workforce tends to look at the, I suppose, the more from the employer. But what this means to some extent is there's even more intense demand for digital skills. Well-being is even more critical to employers to being an employer of choice. Employees work where the skills are. And rather than for company loyalty, they work in flat organization structures. And workers are increasingly contingent workers. They're not just full-time employees. So all these things are, are changes in the actual employee, I suppose, environment, and that's changing considerably the sorts of solutions they're thinking about putting out there. Now, when we ask people how significant do you think these skill, skills gaps will be, or skills gaps will be in the future, one of the things that comes out is actually people expect them to be as significant or more significant. Actually, very few people expect there to be some stagnation in the demand for skills. And most of the research actually over the last four or five years, so this is a CEO research from PwC going about four years ago, shows that actually 63% of CEOs are concerned about the availability of skills in their organization. And it's not just the um, IT skills. 
there's other skill shortages really across the, the, the chasm. It's all skills, soft skills as well. There's a whole range of things. And what's really interesting, I think, from this study, which is very recent, it's only last year, 25% of vacancies are due to skill shortages. Now, you've got a choice. You can either try, go out and try and fish for people and find somebody outside your organization, or you can develop the people in your organization to fill those places. But you have to invest in order for that to happen. So, again, some interesting stats. 40% of European organizations report difficulties in finding employees with the right skills. And despite all of the um, availability of labor, because they're still in unemployment, actually, most people are leaving vacancies unfilled because, um, or 27% of vacancies unfilled because they couldn't find people with the right skills. So there's some real challenges around this. And as I said, it's not just digital skills, which are usually highlighted. There's a range of skill areas that are also needing to be resolved. Soft skills, leadership, management, these all have significant um, highlights. And when we talked and did a survey specifically in this skills of some total survey, the areas that they tend to highlight are all the things at the top here around digital skills, soft skills, leadership, software, um, sales skills. And the green line is where you have all the skills, where you have mostly skills that you need. And then this red zone is where you have some or none. Now, ultimately, you could argue, actually, it's only those places where you only have all the skills, where you don't need to do any training. So actually, in terms of the skills gap that we face, it is potentially enormous. And that's not just to fill the jobs that we have today, it's the new jobs that are being formed in tomorrow. So that's really, I think it's, it's, it's really an interesting challenge about how we fill that space. And what they predict is by 2020, um, the cost of soft skills dev gaps, and this was a survey done with um, McDonald's not so long ago, will cost 8.4 billion a year. I can't even imagine how much money that is. But it's a really interesting pressure, I think, around organizations. But when you ask people how ready they are, um, or how ready the organizations are to meet the expectations of the modern workforce, then what we tend to see is they're not that ready. So in terms of the expectations, so how much do you think your workforce's expectations of your organization as an employer will change in the future? Actually, people expect the expectations to change and how they're expecting those expectations to change is around the areas of personal and professional development, career de progression, utilizing the latest technologies, flexible working, progressive and dynamic organizational culture, and brand reputation. Now I think what's interesting about that list and that was what was identified as the highest rated items from the survey, is that actually things that touch learning around personal, professional development and career progression are really up there as part of potentially the employer brand and also the sense of being in a progressive and dynamic culture. Because you probably can't have a progressive and dynamic culture without an energizing learning strategy and learning delivery. And that has some, I think, some profound implications. I like the one in the middle, the one the person sat in the um, UFO, because this sense of using the latest technologies is something that also attracts people to organizations. So if you have an old style solution to how you deliver and manage learning, then now you're not necessarily living up to the expectations of most modern workers. So this is the sort of challenges that we face as learning professionals, not necessarily just to think about the new systems, new starters, new products, new processes that we need to train out, but also our ability to engage learners in developing themselves and filling out the capabilities they need for the future. So we asked organizations how ready their talent management processes were to cope with the modern workforce and all the changes around the expectations and the changes in working and work. And the best performing areas were those related to performance and appraisal. So what you have here on the list is uh, a view of people who are not ready moving up to they're almost ready to those people who are very advanced. So about here 
is those people who are actually ready to cope with the um, changing environment and the changes uh, in the workforce. So we're looking at, I see, that's 10%, that's 12%, that's 35%. If anybody can do some mental arithmetic for me, I think that's about almost half aren't really ready with their performance management process to engage with the modern workforce. Now, the problem is in a race for talent, if you're not ready, the race is always already over, okay? Now, I'm not sure how fast Usain Bolt runs the 100 meters. I think it's about sub nine seconds. You're in a similar race for talent, right? And if he's at the finishing point and you're just standing on the block saying, I'm almost ready, that's not really a great answer. And this is the best area of, of all the areas, actually, the exclusion of learning. Um, so when you look at the other areas around development planning and career development, learning comes out as being quite ahead. Anything that's more biased to the right is, uh, means the more, it's more progress. But in development planning, L&D tends to be quite weak. And in career development, it tends to be quite weak as well. So there's a whole range of capabilities that um, the modern workforce is looking for that they're not necessarily getting catered for from within the platforms themselves, or your organization isn't prepared for them as well. When you look at learning and then things around internal mobility, which is also what organizations are looking, well, individual employees are looking for from organizations they want to work for, things get a little bit worse in a way. So, as I said, learning is quite well advanced. If you look at people's talent pools, only 6% are advanced with organizing talent pools. Now remember before we said that career progression, having a sense of a future in an organization was really important to the modern workforce. This is a massive opportunity or a massive own goal depending on which way you want to look at it. Actually there's so much opportunity to make sure that the enhanced mobility that most younger workers are looking for to move around in organizations more, with more speed, and get more career progression at a faster rate. You're not going to be able to do that if you don't understand the talents working for you. And it's no surprise then that actually people in a lot, the, I suppose, younger demographic change jobs so frequently if you're not willing or ready to cater for them internally. So that's a big challenge. And then on succession managing, management, making sure that people are ready and aligned into future roles in a constructive way, and you're starting to think about coaching them, again, that's an area that seems to be massively neglected. Only 8% are very advanced, and actually overall, only 24% are actually ready. If you want to have a high-performing workforce, this is not necessarily the answer, but this is what's coming out at the moment. As I said, this is a massive, either a tragedy for the people that work in your organization, or it's a massive opportunity for your organization to make sure that the best people that work for you already are going to be working for you in a year's time by thinking about this in a very constructive way. And just remember that this is a view across the entire um, audience. So if you're able to get advanced, then you're already at the finishing line. Everybody else is still catching up. So this is a massive opportunity in making sure you've got the best people working for your organization with the right skills in the right roles, being the best they can be. So, as I said, the race for talent has already started and the race to attract and retain talent in that race to some extent, being almost ready is not a good answer. But in most instances around some of the key talent processes, that's the state of play. And it's something that we probably need to invest a lot more effort and focus on in order to remedy in the future. So when we think about learning, actually we should be thinking about building capability rather than just following that routine of delivering the next training session. And the answer, it's not a good answer, especially when the availability of skills is so incredibly short. So, only 6% report talent pools are advanced. So how do you compete for talent, really? The sad reality is that most people aren't competing for talent and they're letting it slip between their fingers and it's going somewhere else. So all the things around culture, employer brand, skills, employee engagement, personal development and career progression, which are actually seen as fundamental to having a really strong employer proposition, aren't in place. And as I said, that's a massive opportunity. If you start to pull that out of the bag in a positive way, actually you'll start to hoover up the talent in the marketplace, especially if you're also delivering the sorts of things around the 
um, latest technologies that are embedded in your organization as well. So what's the real problem? Because actually, if it is such an opportunity, you'd think people would be acting on it with even more vigor and enthusiasm and energy. But unfortunately, 82% say that actually there's just a lack of investment. And 84% say actually it's the culture. We don't have a culture that enables us to think about retaining and keeping our best people. Strange. They say 80% of 6% think that manager skills and attitudes aren't right. And the other is actually there are other priorities. There's other things that are more important than having the ability to outperform our competition in two or three years' time. I'm not sure how that works out. But these are the barriers that people see to driving a really effective and impactful um, learning culture, and I suppose a learning organization and an impactful talent agenda. And um, it's something that, if you thought about it, you probably think it's a no-brainer, but it's something that doesn't necessarily happen. So that's a, a view. What's interesting, and I think is probably to all the providers, is actually the existing HR tech providers is the least of our worries. Okay, this is the one that's right at the bottom down here. The availability of IT resources is not a problem. HR's expertise and capabilities is not, is not a problem. So it's not for the want of being able to do it. It's just the senior stakeholder will to get engaged and do it. Now, I don't know if that's necessarily reflective of what you see in your organizations. Do you think your organization takes talent management seriously enough? So do you think your organization takes talent management very seriously? You put your hand up. Cool. So that's one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So who thinks they take it a little bit seriously? Who doesn't take it seriously at all? Okay. So th this is something that you need to raise, potentially, with your stakeholders. And when we think about learning solutions and what we're doing, we need to think about learning as part of this engine room of talent, so to speak. But I think it's fascinating. Executive buying comes up down here. Um, manager skills, attitudes, as I said, it all, it all comes in there. So in many ways, probably the biggest priority for us it, at the moment is to mobilize our stakeholders and think about how we accelerate our approach to talent for the modern workforce. Now, if you haven't got a talent management system, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the end of your debate. But you need to be thinking about what you're doing to, to attract and retain your best people. Think about how you develop and grow them. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think that's probably the most important thing is to actually think about mobilizing those people who are senior stakeholders to in, give you the time, the money, and the inclination to actually act on the opportunities that's available to you. So when we look at the levers that people can use to um, drive talent in their organizations. These were the top five that they came back with, um, all in the sort of almost 80% plus range. And then it's all sort of tailed off actually. So HR's top levers for delivering change and contributing to change. The first up the top here is the employer brand and values. So that's not necessarily learning, but learning forms part of that story because actually the employer proposition is about how you develop them. So it's interesting to think about what you're doing as a learning professional, not just to deliver the day-to-day -day training, but the long-term capability building of your organization. The second is the quality of data and analytics, um, which is an interesting one to me. So actually the quality of data that we have is a barrier. Um, it's something that we need to sort out in order to move things forward. What that really means is if you don't have good people about who your good people are, how do you know who they are? Okay? So actually having data to identify who your best are or who the people have the great potential is and investing in them is something you need to do. So you need good data to make good decisions. The other thing is actually having next generation technologies. So actually that next generation technologies is something that enables you to your employees to think they're actually part of an organization that is thriving and growing and at the forefront. Um, most younger employees want to feel a sense of being involved in the latest technologies. Um, closer integration between business and HR systems is something really important. And what that really means is if the only way you really understand people's performance is integrating yourself with business systems. 
And we're seeing some of that in HR systems overall. Increasingly, they seem to be, for example, built on salesforce.com. So you can get a stronger view between what sales happen and the training that happens in organizations. But that's a, an interesting layer of, you can only see genuine business performance when you have a tight integration between business systems and the HR data. And the final one is strategic influencing skills in HR leadership. So if you're an HR leader, it's those strategic influencing skills to say this is a problem for this audience around this sort of timeline. It's something that is really important that um, you can use. And it's something that's probably one of your critical levers for moving things forward. So those are the chain levers for change. As I said, the modern workforce is considerably changing and the things that we did yesterday don't necessarily work for tomorrow. And that's it. So if you have any questions, I'll happily take any questions. But that was a little bit of a whirlwind tour of the research that we've done with SumTotal. Um, they are on stand 17 if you want to talk to them. There is a report that's related to the survey as well, which you can download through their website.